following on from the the success of the the hidden venice presentation uh, we had great demand for for more to see more of italy and Mary, dr mary jane Cryan has kindly agreed to to share the heart of italy over to you mary okay thank you very much victoria uh today we're going to talk about another one of those iconic parts of italy that everybody knows uh, but i'm going to show it to you in from what I know, and having lived here 55 years, um, not as a tourist, but as a person who actually has lived in Tuscany. And so we'll start with this first slide I'll show you is Siena, which is one of the most beautiful cities in central Italy, in Tuscany. And here's where it is, here's where we are. Let's put, put it on the map. Here's Tuscany, the red part here. So it's central Northern Italy. And when you get to the uh, Tuscany, you can see it's divided into um, several different uh, provinces. And we're going to start our tour or field trip, whatever you want to call it, here on the coast in Livorno. So you'll be hearing about uh, how uh, people would arrive to Tuscany. Now we arrive by train or by airplane, but in the past people arrived by ship and they came into Livorno, which is the, the English call it Leghorn. But we, uh, it's really called Livorno. And then we will take our tour of, of Tuscany from uh, going inland. For, uh, after Livorno, we'll go in towards Florence. And But notice there's much more to Tuscany than just the big cities. So I'll be telling you a little bit about also some of the, what it's like to live in the countryside and introduce you to some of the, oh, oh it's racing ahead. And um, okay, the, uh, we'll just go, try to go back to where we, we were, okay, here we are in Livorno. Uh, it's the port for Tuscany. And it was, oh, it's a relatively new city because it was founded only in 1571 compared to the rest of it, it's quite new. And it was founded by Ferdinando Medici, who was the uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany. And he made the city, he actually constructed it and built fortresses there to have it as an important commercial port. Because at this time, uh, in the 1500s, Pisa, which had been the main port for Tuscany, had become silted up because of the, uh, the waters of the Arno. So in order, for, to, in order to have a good commercial port uh, on the coast, he invented the city of, of Livorno, and he made it a very special port. He, it was a, a road an actual law that said uh, it's a free port. Everyone is welcome. All merchants from all nations should come there and they would have free taxes, no taxes at all. And they could come with their families and do business. Also very, very important at that time, it was freedom of religion was offered by the Tuscan uh, duke. And there was no censorship. That meant that people could uh, produce and uh, publish books and pamphlets of all sorts, which they couldn't do in the papal states in Rome. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that it became a very, very international city. And this is the main uh, monument of, of, of the port area that everybody knows. It's called the Four Moors Statue. And it's right there at the port. There's a picture of what it was like back in the 1600s, and it's still in the same position. But when you do come into Livorno and you get off your boat or your ship, uh, you will see that this area is strange. It's like some things are very ancient buildings from the 15, 1600s, and other things are very modern. There's modern streets with high buildings. This is because the, the port being so important was um, very badly damaged during World War II. But let's go back to when it was still the old city of Livorno, the port, and it was the entrance way to, uh, for everyone to come to Tuscany or to Italy. And it was very famous in um, many English writers talk about it, they write about it. And here's just a few people that went and lived in Livorno and made descriptions of it. But if you try to look, uh, you want, want to find their diaries or descriptions, don't Google Livorno, Google Leghorn, because that's what they called it. And I don't know why, I guess they couldn't pronounce the word Livorno. These are just a few of them. Tobias Smollett, the famous uh, diarist, uh, Lord Byron and Shelley, two famous romantic poets and writers. They spent some time there too. And then Charles Dickens uh, stayed in Livorno back in 1845, and of course, many painters too. So it was quite well known uh, all around the globe. And we have the descriptions from that time from our English writers. 
Uh, another section, uh, remember we said it was religious freedom? So this is one of the reasons in the city of Livorno today, you find cemeteries and churches of all different denominations. I mean, there are Jewish synagogues, there are Muslim temples, there are all kinds of different churches that were built by the different international groups. And one of these um, was an American, the one uh, Elizabeth Seaton, who went there in 1804, and she converted to Catholicism uh, when her husband died. And then she was so well taken care of by the, the local people that she, when she left to go back to Maryland, she was from Maryland, she founded her own group of um, uh, nuns or a, a group of ladies to help other people like she had been taken care of when she was in Livorno. And she became the first American saint. So Livorno is always famous for the religious tolerance uh, and, and also for the commercial uh, aspect, they had there was such a big commerce that they actually built these consulates. There's a whole street in 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 the uh, downtown, the uh, old beautiful uh, 1600s area that has one after the other these buildings that were owned by different. Uh, countries, uh, different uh, commercial countries that had uh, that worked with uh, bringing things in to Livorno. There's a list of them there. And that's a, one of the beautiful streets with a beautiful little courtyard. So don't be afraid to walk in and visit some of these places when you do get to Livorno. Another section is where the commerce and the merchandise was offloaded from the ships. This is different from Venice, you see, but it looks a little bit like Venice. Huh? There are all of these canals that come in from the, uh, the sea and the um, merchants would unload and they'd have their um, warehouses right there on the canals. Today, they're used for the um, sporty boats that everybody has. Everybody seems to have boats in, in, uh, in Livorno. And uh, th there's even a canal tour that you can do that brings you through some of these areas. And you'll notice the enormous fortresses that were built by the Medici. They're still there, but they're in pretty sh sad shape nowadays. But they were very, very big. And, and some of them were damaged during World War II, as I mentioned. So there are these navigable canals that sort of circle around in the uh, area of the port. Uh, two uh, famous people that you uh, might have heard of that are connected with uh, Livorno, Amedeo Modigliani, the famous painter who didn't really spend much time there. He went off to Paris to become a bohemian. He didn't live very long, unfortunately. And then for the musicians, Mascagni is a very famous composer who was from um, the city. Okay, and then, of course, there's the architecture, the, uh, the beautiful Liberty Marketplace and the Theater, the Goldoni Theater, which is, uh, there's an interior shot of it. And then for those of you who like to collect uh, antiques like I do, I was surprised how many antique shops there are in the town, especially in the area near the Goldoni Theater. And this is because uh, the merchants and the shipmakers and the people who went out and then brought things back to the city also brought beautiful things from abroad. So there's a huge amount of oriental uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, porcelains to be found there that is unusual for Italy. You usually find Italian things, but there's uh, many of the old families collected uh, pieces from the Orient. So these are some of the things that might interest you in the city. Other things, of course, if you're traveling with children, they'll want to see the aquarium. There's a beautiful aquarium. And then there's the terrazza named after Mascagni, which is this beautiful tiled seaside boardwalk made out of tiles, not of boards. And that's a beautiful walk in the evening. And uh, Livorno is also famous for its Naval Academy. If, um, if you are a boy wants to go into the Navy, you go to the Naval Academy and it's right there in the, in the town. Um, and th that's the tradition of the town. So it was a smart idea to put the Naval Academy there. So these are uh, three other very interesting things to see. Also, I know everybody's interested in food. So take a tour, take a trip through the uh, market, that beautiful Art Deco market, which is in the center of town along one of the canals. And this is a good idea for you. I'm going to give you tips as I go through of how to make your visit to a place you don't know easier. What we do is we always go into the market and ask the men at the fish stalls, who, what are the restaurants that they sell to? Who are the, the restaurants that take their fish fresh daily? And of course, they'll point out to you and give you the address, the name. So you can always find the best fish restaurants in the town by asking the um, sellers at the market. Okay, so that's another thing. You can also visit downstairs. 
Uh, here's my friend Fulvio. He he went with us and he's very interested in food, of course, because he writes cookbooks. So uh, they took us down and showed how they offload the food from the canal boats and then put it in the refrigerator section. Every stall upstairs has a refrigerator room downstairs. I didn't know that. So then uh, we went up and tried some of their wonderful pesto that they were selling. Their pesto made with um, uh, local herbs and basil. So that's another possibility. And it also gives you a good idea of how much things cost in a country when you visit the, the regular market. And like uh, most Italians, we always go out maybe once, uh, more than two times a week and buy every day our fresh bread, our fresh cheese. Uh, people here do that. So um, it was really difficult for us during this period of lockdown. We had to, to go to a supermarket was a scary event. Okay, and another beautiful place, if you want just to relax and see a house museum, is this beautiful park and villa uh, just along that boardwalk that I showed you. It's called Villa Montbelli, and there's the entrance where it's a uh, public park nowadays, but it, before it was the home of a painter, Giovanni Fattori, and this is his staircase. I couldn't believe this very fantastic staircase with all those little putti, those little uh, ceramic uh, characters that so you walk up this red carpet and you go up to the top floor and, and as you're exploring you'll notice also all the decor all of the windows the uh, everything is the way it was when Giovanni Fattori lived there back in the beginning of the 19th century and his paintings are on the top floor so it's it's one of those museums that you and maybe one other couple are the only ones inside because it's very particular. It's dedicated to the painting of Fattori who did you know, farm scenes and scenes of uh, life around Livorno. Okay, from um, Livorno, those are a few things that you probably didn't know about it. Now we're going inland a little bit. You see, we were on the coast here in Livorno and we go in, it's only about a 15 minute um, train ride to go to the city of Pisa. So uh, it's just following in. That's why uh, it was a smart, when I mean, Pisa wasn't able to be a port anymore, they just moved the port down to Livorno. So we're in Pisa now, and it's famous for its architecture, the masterpieces of the churches, and all of those together are called the Field of Miracles because it's, they're so beautiful and they're all close together. Uh, Pisa is, oh, of course, now much more famous just for this thing, for the tower. But the tower is only one of the many architectural gems in the city. It's also uh, has a very long history. Uh, as I mentioned, it was the port and many Roman ships have recently, maybe about 15 years ago, have been found uh, under the sand or the silt of the river. And they've excavated them and made a little a museum of the Roman ships. This is what they looked like. They had the, the amphorae filled with all of their oil or grain. This is how they shipped in the old days. They didn't have containers. These were the ancient Roman containers. So it was a, had a long history they, from Roman times. And then from the 800s to about the 1200s, it was a <clears throat> very famous maritime republic, just like Venice. We saw Venice was one of these important uh, shipping towns uh, actual separate republic, a separate um, country. And then, of course, today we go there for the, the beautiful uh, architecture. These are two shots from inside the Duomo. And that is one place that everyone will go right away uh, to visit the inside of the Duomo. And I hope that doesn't happen while you're there. <laughs> Earthquakes. Okay. Also, it's very famous as a university city. Now, it's not the oldest university in Italy. That's Bologna. That was founded in 1088. Can you imagine? That's when my, one of my daughters went to university. It's been around since 1088. But in the 1500s, it's the place that the, um, was set up as the first botanic gardens. And I know a lot of you ladies are interested in gardens and botanic, uh, botany. So this was the first botanic garden invented or created at the university. Because you can imagine with all of the in, unusual plants and trees that were being discovered in the new world, they brought back samples and seeds and planted them there at the university. And famous, of course, the university for its scientists, for uh, Galileo, he lived there. Fibonacci, the famous mathematician. All, all of these men worked there, 1600s, 1700s, and they uh, made the city 
uh, really drawing point for um, students from all over the world. Notice this little old map. I have quite a few uh, Pisa maps because my father-in-law was from Pisa. So I got lots of maps to take off the wall. This little church is where he was baptized, right on the Arno River. And notice how the Arno cuts right across the city, dividing it into two parts. Now this creates competition because Italian guys love to compete with each other. So they've got all of these festivals that are, you know, come, they have to show how, how strong they are. So the people in the north up here where the, uh, the, all of the Field of Miracles is located, and then the people in the south, they, each one thought their side was stronger. So they invented a few very unusual and strange traditional uh, competitions. And this is the one that has been going on since, you know, way back in the 1560s. It's called the Gioco del Ponte. The, it's original. It's just like a tug of war. They dress up in these hysterical costumes, which they that's how they dressed to go into battle, I think, in the 1500s. And every year, on, except these last two years, on June 26, they reenact this, this tug of war, pushing a machine from one side or to the other of the of the bridge so it's the game of the bridge but and this of course they're not having it this year or last year but another famous uh, traditional happening that happens june is the month for festivals in in central italy june because it's warm and people want to stay out later so this is another traditional festival that probably will happen because it doesn't involve a lot of men in funny costumes and in groups lots of people together it's just the lighting up of the river People put lights, it's a lot like Christmas lights. Before it was all candles. Now it's probably lead, you know, the, the brighter lead lights. And so they illuminate the river, the palaces, the buildings, the churches, and then they go on their boats up and down just to enjoy the scene. And of course, all the other lights are turned off so that people can enjoy this. So San Raniero is their um, patron saint. Every city initially has its own patron saint and they put on a big show for their patron saint. So that's June 17th. And so if you happen to be in this area in June next year, uh, remember that's the time to be there if you wanna see something really spectacular like this. And then of course, there's lots of fireworks and people eat out on the streets, very fun. So that's something in Pisa, but the main attraction, and this is always on, of course, is this field of miracles. It's, you saw on the map where it is, all up in a corner there uh, in the city, the bell tower, the, which is the, the famous leaning tower, the Duomo, the main church, beautiful Gothic church. And then, of course, there's the baptistry, which I'll show you in a minute, and the uh, cemetery, which are other places that people probably didn't realize. There are four major buildings all together in that area. Here's another inside shot of the uh, Duomo, and that's the baptistry. Uh, that funny little, um, beautiful little building, which has amazing acoustics inside. So our famous um, scientists, Galileo and Fibonacci, they use these places to do some of their experiments. Uh, the lamp, you see the lamp hanging? This is in the Duomo. And this lamp that's hanging from the Duomo, uh, the ceiling, the beautiful ceiling, was used by Galileo and also the tower. He used to drop things from the tower to measure speed against weight and things like that. So uh, we, if you do go, make sure you visit at least these two buildings. I, if I were you, I wouldn't bother to climb the tower. It's really scary because you're, it's, you know, leaning. So don't bother to go on the tower, but go in the baptistry and go in the Duomo. And then the cemetery, which was, I was really surprised. You know, you think of a cemetery, but this is really a sculpture gallery. Everybody that was somebody in, in Pisa had to have a beautiful sculpture made for their final resting place. So they made this enormous building and it's covered uh, around is all green grass. And notice the chains in this picture here, you see this, this very lush, this, uh, unusual a woman half naked lying on top of a tomb. And then up here you have chains. Now these chains were actually chains that were put across the Arno to protect the city from pirate invasions. And they kept them and they put them there in the, um, in the cemetery to remember the, the years that they had these problems. Also in Const, um, Istanbul, they used to have the same thing because the, the Genovese um, had a section of Istanbul and they also used this technique to keep out the pirate ships. 
putting the chains across the river. So this is the cemetery and it has, uh, it's enormous and it's, it's, it's quite an unusual place. Uh, it's not our idea of a cemetery. People visit it as if it were a museum because it really is. Okay, after that, we can go out into the countryside because Pisa and Florence are very hot in the summertime. And the people who lived there decided, oh, let's, they escaped. By June, most of them were out of, the, uh, out of the city and staying or on the seaside or staying in their villas in the countryside. And this is a typical villa. It's called Villa Corleano. It's maybe only a 30 minute drive, but it's up, up in the hills a little bit. So it's nice and cool and very beautiful. Now they do weddings there. It's a very beautiful place. And nearby there's a spa where the people would go to drink water. And that was the big thing in those days. People would go out and, and stay at the spa and, and uh, live the country, the villegiatura, the villa life. And then of course, if you had to stay in the city, you might be staying in a building like this one, which is beautiful, but it's still you know, right in the center of the city. This is the parts of the Knights of Santo Stefano. Notice all the Medici busts along the top and then the graffiti um, decoration. So the, the, the architecture is magnificent. These are buildings from the 1500s to 1600s and they're still kept beautifully. So this is a different, um, two different styles of life but both can be uh, fun, especially if you get to spend three months in the country and then the other months in the city. Now, Tuscany, of course, is famous for its artisans. Everywhere you go, Pisa and all of the other cities, you will find artisans that still work in the same way as their uh, ancestors did. And usually these are uh, traditional crafts that are passed down from one family to the other. And this picture of just really the colors, look at these beautifully hand-painted plates. So this is something that many people like to buy when they come to Italy, the ceramics. Then of course, there's the leather work, the, the wood, uh, wood carving, the fashion, the wine, the olive oil. And what, one thing most of we, we, uh, we like uh, ladies is the gold and silver that is done by, still done in the old way. And this is a nice photo from a friend of mine who has a uh, agriturismo there near Pisa. That's why I put it here in the Pisa section. Okay, now what's coming next? Ah, the other, the big, one of the other big cities, Florence, which everybody loves, everybody goes to. But it's nice to know that you can pass from a big city to a small town and have, and feel the lifestyle because it's not just big cities. If you're in Florence, generally it's only you and other tourists in the months of July and August. So here we'll have the, um, really the cradle of the Renaissance. You've got the Uffizi, you have the architecture. Oh, notice, this is just like Pisa now. You see the buildings, you've got the Duomo, which is the church. Then you behind it, you see the cupola of Brunelleschi. And then you see the tower peeking out. That was made by Giotto. So you have the great masters of architecture and the building right in the front that's shaped like an octagonal, that is the baptistry. So these four different buildings, there's not a cemetery though, like there was in Pisa, but they usually group them together. And that was the religious center of the, of the city. But we have art indoors and outdoors. Notice here, this beautiful bronze. This is on the uh, um, Loggia dei Lanzi and right in front of the city hall. So these are, uh, it's a city that is so full of art and architecture. You have to be careful because sometimes especially if you're from a country that's new or that doesn't have a lot of art and you've studied it and you're dying to see it, when you finally arrive, if you try to see too much, you can get the Stendhal syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's you actually faint or, or go limp because you have seen too much beauty in such a small concentrated time. So take it easy, see one thing, go and see the David and then go and have an ice cream, a gelato. Okay, you can't see too much or you get overload, you know, it's just like having your, your uh, you, you run out of your batteries or something. So take it easy and do like the Italians do. Go out early. The museums here open at 8.30 in the morning, not at 10 or 11, at 8.30, because that's when people go to the museums, when it's fresh. And then go home, have your lunch, have a siesta, especially if you go in the summertime, because very few places are air conditioned anyway, thank goodness, because... It's not necessary because these buildings are so thick. In fact, in the room I'm in here, I don't have air conditioning and it's cool. In fact, I have to open the window to let the heat in right now as it stays cool all summer long because of the thickness of the walls. 
So this is, uh, I'll be giving you some tips on how to survive and thrive when you are visiting these big cities. Go to the gardens, go and visit some villas outside the city, just like you would do if you were in Pisa. Okay, so these are just two examples of some of the villas. There are many that belong to the Medici, scattered around on the hillsides, just outside the city. You can reach them by city bus even. The one that you see up on the top with all those beautiful cypress trees, that is the Villa Itati, which was owned by it in the 1900s by the famous art critic and art historian Bernard Berenson. I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard of him. He was um, he sold, helped to sell art to the rich Americans from Italy. And he was a famous art historian. And after he, when he died, he left his villa to his old college, his university in America, New York University. So if you're a scholar or you want to do any kind of research on Renaissance art, try to get into the Villa Itati program. It is really amazing. Uh, usually it's people from New York University, but there are other many different schools, colleges, universities. I think there's even one uh, from Australia, maybe this is South African University that has a program for studying in Florence. In fact, when you go to Florence, you'll see so many um, English speaking um, young people there, there to study. And then also Villa Gambera. These are typical Italian gardens. And notice not many flowers, it's mostly the green, the, 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 <clears throat> the trees uh, are cut in a beautiful way, and the hedges, which is a, the, uh, the way of design, garden design here in Italy. And it has been since the 1580s. Okay, let's see what comes after the gardens. The pal oh, the palazzi. Some of the palazzi that you might, I know you've heard of the Academia. That's where the, the beautiful statue of uh, da David is kept, the original. The uh, reproduction is there in front of the city hall. So you don't have to go in to see the original because sometimes that's where the lines are. But nowadays, with, since the uh, problems with the COVID, almost all museums want you to make a booking online beforehand so you know exactly what hour you are. It's silly to go there and wait in line. The whole idea is not to make groups of people stay together. And so that's, um, you, you have your exact time that you have to go in and then come out. Oh, so there are lots of other less crowded museums, like this beautiful one I'm showing you now. It's another Medici palace, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi. And inside are these beautiful frescoes uh, <clears throat> uh, which show members of the Medici family on horseback going out hunting. And I notice they have uh, uh, dogs and falcons and all kinds of things for hunting. And uh, I think there's even the the self-portrait of the, uh, the artist whose name escapes me at the moment. You can look that up. Okay, so there's another palace. There are other many palaces that are, have become museums. This is my, one of my favorites, Palazzo d'Avanzati, which is right in the center of town. And it shows, uh, the pictures I'm showing you here are two bedrooms. And that's very interesting because how did people sleep in those times? Remember, they had no heating, so they have, each one, each room has its corner fireplace. And uh, you can see the Gothic style and the wonderful beds that probably had sh uh, cur curtains around them too, because it get pretty cold inside at night. And uh, notice the walls, they have, have no tapestries on them. The tapestries were expensive, so they were kept for the reception rooms where you would have people come in. These were private rooms, so they just frescoed them. It cost less than having a tapestry. So nowadays, the tapestries are missing, but we still have <clears throat> the frescoes on the walls. Here's a couple of other beautiful museums that are set up as if you were walking into someone's private home, the Bardini, the Horn, and the Stibbert. Now, don't be surprised. Horn and Stibbert were English guys who came to Florence. They had lots of money, and they collected furniture, beautiful furniture, or arms and armor, and then they left all of their beautiful collections to the city of Florence. So now they're still there for us to go to visit today. So these are other beautiful buildings. They're not the ones that most tourists go to, but if you are interested in antiques or decorative arts, these are places that you will be you'll, they'll blow you away. And if you like the idea of living in a Renaissance palazzo, you can even do that. Because I have friends who have these beautiful buildings. This, I think, is the, the um, Piccolomini family uh, palace. And it's called Palazzo Antilesi. And they have now changed them all into apartments uh, that people can rent out. So you can live 
like a Florentine. You can live there, you have your kitchen, and you can go at your own pace, come back home. And instead of just being in a small hotel room, you have a huge apartment uh, in a building like this. That Again, notice the facade. It's all decorated. And it's the original building from this late 1500s, early 1600s. And the Principessa still lives inside. She has her apartment too. Okay, here's another beautiful building with the graffiti work on the facade. This belonged to another Medici uh, <clears throat> family. It's Palazzo Bianca Capello. But the biggest Medici building is the one you see down in the lower part, Palazzo Pitti, which is gigantic. And uh, it now is a museum, but it's so big, don't think you can see it all. You can just go and see the section of the silvers or the section of the paintings. But it's, it's enormous. And when you get tired, though, this is something good. Right in the back of it, there is the gardens, the Boboli Gardens. And another thing, eh, I'm not going to tell you all of the different festivals they have in Florence. But when you do get to Florence and you don't want to see something that's happening that week, because the exhibits, for example, come and go, you can find out what's going on, what's on in Florence. And as a journalist, I used to write for the Rome um, magazine called Wanted in Rome. So if you want to know what's happening in Rome, you can even go online. By now, everything's online. Go and find, type in Wanted in Rome, and you'll see all the things that are on in Rome the week or the 15 days you're there. And the same thing for Florence. The, the magazine that's online is called The Florentine. So you can go and look there and see what's on. And I found out that this beautiful ceramic show is on right now until June 6th. But it's a traveling show. So after it uh, finishes in Florence, it'll be going to another city and even to, uh, to Poland. It's a traveling show. And these are some of the most magnificent ceramics from all over Italy on show in one place uh, in Florence. So make sure you remember these two uh, magazines online that you can check out and find what there is special on while you're there. Oh, now let's get back to Palazzo Pitti. Here's another view of where Palazzo Pitti is, you see, you look across the river and you can see the, the, the cupola of Brunelleschi there. Um, and then right up in the back are these bobbly gardens. And the best views of the city, because I know everybody wants to see the whole city as if you're in a, in a drone or something, go up to Piazzale Michelangelo, which is just up the hill a bit. You can walk up or you can take the bus and it just curves around and you get up on top and you can get a full view. But remember, if you really want to visit Florence and, and, and stay healthy and not get to a uh, culture lag or culture shock, try to do this. One museum, one church, one gelato, okay? Break it down. Uh, it's, you can't see everything. So see one thing and see it in depth, but then have a pause and go and have your gelato. The best gelato in Florence is this one, Vivoli. But most places really make them well. Okay, let's go on. That's after Florence. I think we have a few more on Florence. Oh, yes. Uh, I, you must have understood by now that I like antiques. and that, But uh, there's a whole street in Florence with shop, uh, shopping for antiques. And it's called Via Maggio. So if you, in the afternoon, after your museum in the morning, go out and take a walk on Via Maggio. Or go over to Ponte Vecchio. Ponte Vecchio is uh, the last bridge uh, that has the houses still there. It's just way back, a really old bridge. And nowadays it has all the gold shops on it. So that's another place to wander and make sure you have your um, credit card with you. <laughs> okay, so those are the beautiful things to do in Florence. See the artisans of the silver and the gold, the antiques, the ceramics. Oh, then I'm going to introduce you to a few people who live there who are specialists in their field, like Judy Witz, she lives in Florence and she also lives in Certaldo, which is a small town um, outside, and she does cooking classes. I went with her on a market tour to the Florence market and learned so much. She also writes cookbooks and she's online. She does cooking classes with Zoom. So uh, nowadays, everybody has sort of uh, taken over this new technology. So if you can't be there in person, you can do it on Zoom. So that's Judy. She's American. She's been there for about 30, 35 years. And then, of course, as I mentioned, she is in Florence and outside. And also many people like to go outside the city to have the lifestyle of the countryside. Here's the house of my friend, the writer Ferenc Maté. He has a winery. He and his wife produce the most famous, uh, most expensive wine 
in Italy is called Brunello di Montalcino. So the, and they do uh, wine tastings. Everybody who has a vineyard also does wine tastings. And those, again, you can go out on your own book ahead of time because people are working. They are actually uh, doing the vendemia, doing the, uh, the harvest. They can't you know, have people knocking at the door all the time, but you can book a, a wine tasting in any of these wonderful wine areas in Tuscany. And of course, if you want to try the best is Brunello di Montalcino. Very expensive, but really worthwhile. Okay, and everybody has wine. This is my neighbor, Paolo, and he's in his cantina right underneath, right next door to me. And this is, he makes it by hand. And the, the vendemia or the grape harvest is done in September. So every September, Paolo and his grandson carry the, the grapes in and put it in this little machine that he uses by hand. And they make their own for the house, for themselves. They do not sell it, of course. Uh, but if you want to experience the real best, they're the Cinelli Colombini family, who are also in <clears throat> Montalcino. It's a beautiful, real professional cantina and winery. And they are all women, which is a, a wonderful thing. All the women, this is uh, Donatella and her daughter and all of the staff, all the people who work for her are women, even the ones who collect the grapes in, in the vendemia, in the harvest. And they have also agriturismo. You can go and eat. You can stay over, not just drink wine, but another. This is a big company, not like my neighbor. OK, so these are things that people love to do when they come to Tuscany. Something else you might want to actually stay on a farm. Farmhouse tourism is called agriturismo. And this is Pamela Sheldon Johns uh, at her doorway of Poggio Etrusco. And she also writes cookbooks and she has cooking classes and she also makes oil, but she has a lot of olive trees. And so she's been very busy. Uh, and so now, June 1st, things are opening up. So people will be coming to stay again because they have had nothing to do except write cookbooks in this past year and a half and, and, and do their olive harvest, of course. OK, another person that you might like to visit is Nora Kravis, who has a wonderful goat farm in Chianti called Chianti Kashmir. Now, these are all American ladies who have the dream life uh, that many people want. Uh, they have come to Italy and they set themselves up to do something they love. And Nora has, uh, uh, does everything with her goats. All the products she makes, the soaps, uh, uh, the cashmere uh, wool that she makes scarves and things from. And she also has, it's great for kids, this last one. You can do shepherd for a day. You go there and you walk with the goats and you actually do the life of a shepherd, which is not easy, it seems. So this is another experience, because when you come to Italy, you want to experience the lifestyle. And these people have done that. And they, off, they offer these wonderful possibilities that, you know, you can't, uh, you can't live your life just in museums and churches, OK? OK. And for the musicians among you, these are two wonderful festivals that will definitely be held this year because they are outdoor festivals. The top one is near Chianciano, La Foce, which is a, a traditional uh, music festival all out of doors. Then the Puccini Opera Festival, which is on the coast um, near the, it's actually on the grounds of the house that Puccini lived in. And I remember going there and seeing Madame D Butterfly. It was ma marvelous. But make sure you have your mosquito repellent because it's outdoors and it's summer. So there are mosquitoes in Italy, unfortunately. That's why people like to go to a place that has screens on the windows. Okay. Now there's many, many other wonderful smaller towns, hill towns. They call them hill towns because most of them are built like that in a, a sort of like a fortified hilltop. And uh, Siena, we'll be getting to I'll talk about that in a minute. But everybody knows San Gimignano, which is the one with all the towers. And then Monte Pulciano, Volterra, which is famous for its alabaster. They, have a, they make everything in alabaster. And it's a good idea to do maybe a stay in a big city when you want to do your museums and churches and then go to a smaller town and you get to actually live the life um, of, the, of the people. That's why I'm so happy to live in this small town, Vetralo, which is just down the coast from Tuscany. I look up my terrace and I can see the hills of, of Tuscany in the, um, in the, on the horizon. I'm gonna show you now a picture, I think of Monte Pulciano. This is a map, how it's made. You see, it's all little windy streets and all of those writing there, that's all the things that are important to see. So even if it's a small town, 
maybe 15,000 or 10,000. It has a lot to see. You do not have to travel big distances. Everything is very compact here. Okay, so uh, you just walk out the door and you might see a Renaissance building or you might go to the piazza and look at the piazza of Montepulciano. It's, that's how it is now. It's empty, no people, because it's, uh, well, my, they're starting to come back out now for their evening uh, walk in the town, maybe go for a drink with their friends. But there are two faces of Tuscany. There is the quiet village or some small town <clears throat> space. Now they started to put the chairs and the tables out in the piazza. So people are now going out and, and using their public spaces, which are magnificent. So this is Monte Pulciano as it has been this last year and a half. Now, don't get worried. This next picture I'm going to show you. <clears throat> Sometimes our towns look like this. So you don't want to go when it like, it's like that. Huh? This is what Siena looks like when they have the uh, Palio. The Palio is the big horse race that used to be held, except these last two years, every July and then August 15th. And the crowds are incredible. I personally have never been, I, I've always been in Tuscany in the summer at our house at the seaside, but I watch it on TV because this is really scary. And I think it's more scary now after we've been sort of alone for a year and a half. But in fact, these photos, I, my friend Mauro, who lives there in Siena, he did them. I wouldn't dream of going into the piazza when it was like that. But these are the two faces. Big festivals create lots of crowds. That's why they've been suspended. But I hear that in October, <clears throat> they will have a smaller one with just maybe 100 people scattered around. But because it's such an important tradition, you can't just ignore it. They've been doing this for hundreds of years because they like to compete. And this is the what the Palio is. It's this tapestry, this painting you see that is being carried in on the <clears throat> oxen cart. And this is the prize. The Palio is the prize that the winning horse Horseman uh, gets it, the one who wins the, the race. So the city is divided into all of these different sections and they compete against each other, like Pisa, the north and the south. But here there are 14 different sections of town and they have their own colors, they have their own costumes, and they each have their own horse. And the horses are, uh, they ride them bareback, no saddles. Huh? And here they are coming in. These are Mauro uh, showing the different parts of the. Um, now, what happens? They come in slowly. They line them up behind the wire. The uh, It's called the, the rope, you might say. There's a rope only. And they have to stand behind the rope. When the, the, the gun is shot off, they start running like bats out of hell. And even if the uh, jockey falls off, the horse is still running. And it's the horse that wins. And the only rule about this palio, crazy palio horse race, are there are, there are no rules. You can, you can hit the other man with your whip. You can uh, bribe him to fail and you win because the important part is winning to show the other 13 that you are the best section of the town. Now, they don't all 14 ride uh, every time. They, um, do a, they pick a name out of the hat to see which of the horses, which Contrado will run each, each uh, race. And then when they do win, they are the hero for the rest of the year. And they win the palio. So let's hope they do come back. And 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 it's it's a pretty dangerous horse race, you can imagine, because the, the piazza that they're running around is this piazza. You see it? It's it's a fan shape. It's not even flat. It's up and down. So they have to run around the uh, the outside, and it happens like in in, in two or, two or three minutes, it's all over. And some people get really hurt. Some of the horses get very badly hurt. Uh, but it's a tradition and it's something that everybody loves about Siena. And I'm showing you this to show you the piazza where uh, this young lady, Serena, lives. And she's a guide and she organized these photographs of the Palio because, as I said, I've never been. I, I wouldn't bother to go. It's too dangerous. And um, her grandmother is from South Africa, she told me, from Pretoria. So she understands what you would be interested in seeing when you come. So this is uh, one of the many people who has, <clears throat> she's Italian now, but her grandmother came uh, from Pretoria to live in Siena. So th this is Siena, and that is the high point of Siena. But in the meantime, there's all kinds of museums and beautiful buildings and a lovely lifestyle and very good food. I hear Serena is quite a good cook, too. Okay, so this is, I think that's the last picture, the 
the, the fantastic Palio is sort of the high point. And then, of course, now we have time. Let's read up more about Tuscany, because the more you know, the more you will enjoy being there. And of course, it's not just the films that talk about Tuscany. You've all seen the film by Frances Mays, who lives in Cortona. And so if you want to learn about Cortona, you can read her book. If you want to read about Montepulciano, you read these two top books, which are by Ferenc, who lives there. And they're very funny, too. If you want to learn about Galileo and Pisa, I would suggest Galileo's daughter is the story of the, um, the father and the daughter. Galileo's the father. The daughter was a nun in a convent. And they wrote back and forth to each other. Uh, very sad because that's what happened to many girls in, in the 1600s. They get put in the convent. And then if you want to hear about <clears throat> uh, Livorno, the, the, there's a book by my friend Patricia Chen. It's called Rosemary and Bitter Oranges. She lives in uh, Todi now, but she used to live in Livorno. And she has recipes inside her book, too. So these are just some books that you can read. And then, of course, the more, as I said, the more you know, the more you'll appreciate. And because you have to go more in depth. We have time now. The whole idea of travel is to go in, in, in depth instead of trying to jump around and see 10 10 uh, cities in, in five days. It's impossible. Okay, so I think we're going to end here. Uh, these are just the books that I write, and I have written one about Tuscany, but it's out of print by now. It's, I wrote it maybe 10 years ago, Travels to Tuscany. It's written on the diaries of a, a in the 1700s about a famous cardinal, Cardinal Henry Stewart, and his travels. And amazingly, you can read the, his diary and then go inside the, the Duomo and see the same paintings in the same place they were back in the 1700s. And these are other little books that I've written. Uh, some are bilingual, this one is bilingual. So if you're looking to improve your Italian, you can read a bilingual book. So if you wanna keep in touch, I'm very happy if you wanna make friends with me on Facebook or on Twitter. I Once in a while I go on Twitter and on Instagram, I'm always putting pictures of what my life is like here in Italy. So if you wanna go on Instagram, I'm called Mary Vitrala on Instagram. Okay, so these are some of my uh, tips for, oh, my, by the way, there's my website up there too, elegantetruria.com, because this area where I live and all of the sections called Etruria, that's why I've written two, several books called Etruria. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to um, our, our host, who uh, hostess who let me come to visit you. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm available. Or if you wanna send me a question, uh, you can send me on my Elegant Etruria. There's a contact page there. Okay, so anybody have a question? Or I, if not, I will just say goodbye to you. Mary Jane, um, you say you, your books are out of print, but are they available um, on Kindle or yeah, um, e-book at all? Do you know? I have, some of them are in e-book. I have five copies left of the Irish and English, and I but I do have five copies, paper copies, but I can send that as an ebook. The others, um, um, I'm not sure. This one, I have copies, the oil and uh, memories in the kitchen that I wrote with full mm -hmm. oil, and that's okay. in both languages. Um, I can even send the hard copies. I just sent a couple, I sent some oil to America and I included some books inside. I'm not going to send oil to South Africa, but I can send if you have five people who want them, I can make a DHL shipment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we struggle with our um with our customs, even with even with um even with DHL, they we have we struggle a bit with that. Yeah. But uh, we can make make a plan when we what we tend to do is when somebody's traveling, we say, can you take can you carry this for me? But uh -huh. uh, obviously at the moment, that's not really that's not really too if much. If you do come to Italy, you are welcome to come into my library and, you, and I can give you the books right then and there. I, I would, drink I would wine love on the terrace. <laughs> I was just looking behind you. Your library is amazing. Oh. I'd love to have yeah. a browse. But um, these, I, I had these come are across um, bilingual books. That's an amazing, amazing thing to you know, to get, improve your vocabulary. Absolutely. And in fact, many students are using it. And, and many of these, the, the, this book over here on the right-hand corner down there, Itrudia, Travel, History and Itineraries in Central Italy. All of the, uh, all of the tour, uh, tour guides get it. Because some of the things that I've discovered, they didn't know. And also uh, in the Palazzo book, I tell the story of my building, which is where I am right now in this huge Palazzo. 
And I, it's in both languages. So the people of the town will learn their history because some of them, they have no idea what, what is this building. Some of them never even noticed it. But um, the, the 10 of them all together in books that I've, I've written about this area. Plus the Rome guidebooks. When I lived in Rome, I wrote uh, for <clears throat> the Dur Durling Kindersley Rome Eyewitness Guide to Rome. I know many people have that before they come to Rome. But um, I, I did that way back in the 90s. So because when you're living in a place and you don't know and you're a journalist and a historian, you start finding out things. And then uh, that's one of the reasons that I published them, because uh, I had I found out. And I said, that's amazing. Who knew that King Henry VIII owned the town I live in? He actually owned wow, it. Wow, really? He's given this, this city of Vitrala by Pope Julius II the same one who had Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel. And nobody knew it because this town has been bombed. It has been invaded by the French, Napoleon. Yeah. Everybody's been through. So their archives are practically empty. Yeah. And I had to go to, to do the book Travels to Tuscany. I went all the way to the British Library in London three times in order to find the material that spoke about this area. So wow. I've been a very busy girl. <laughs> no, no, it was an area that's magnificent, but nobody really paid attention because right next door is Tuscany. Down there is Rome. And those were the big magnets. This in, inside area between Rome and Tuscany, where I live, was just sort of, you know, the place you went to for your vacation or, you know, the, the, the popes and the cardinals all built their villas here. But they mm -hmm. didn't, um, there was no real story of the city it didn't really exist and also because what there was was taken away by the invading forces that have been thrown yeah. of course yes as always as always happens and there is so much history i mean there's different levels of history roman before the romans there were the etruscans so uh, it has become in the last 20 years since i've been here uh, a very important area the city of viterbo next to me is um <clears throat> filled with a uh, university um study abroad programs, then there's a high school program in English, and there's also a, a grade school in English because a lot of people are moving out of Rome and coming to live in these small towns because they don't have to go to the office anymore. They have they'd rather have a big place and a wonderful lifestyle without the city traffic and the noise and the expense. It's much cheaper to live here. And of mm -hmm. course, we have good wine, we have great food, and it's all kilometer zero. Okay. Yeah, and nice. Today we tried to go out to eat at a restaurant. They were packed full. You know, we just couldn't get into a restaurant today. So we'll do that next uh, week. Yeah, of living in a tourist hub. No, we know that. Really too well. here, but people from Rome, finally, they can travel outside their city. So they're they're really all the cars. The the traffic is terrific this weekend. It's a four yeah. day weekend. It's like a Memorial Day. Uh, of course, uh, yes. It's the, the, the yeah. festival of the Republic when the Republic of Italy was was made. Ah, I see. Day. So okay. it's a big four day weekend, you might say. Yeah, it's Whitson weekend in in the UK this weekend. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's a long weekend also. Oh, so. Okay. Well, Mary Jane, you've done it again. You've just, <laughs> unfortunately, you just make us heart sore that we can't uh, travel. But As now you can you study you up a little bit. Go. So when you do come, because I know some of you will be coming. Uh, I will be here because I, I, I don't think my cruises are starting again till October. And I mean, I'm okay. not in any hurry to get on a cruise ship right now. It's <laughs> no, it, it has kind of lost its appeal for, for a lot of us, uh, sadly. But, uh, but yeah. You're but here with me in spirit. And um, it's amazing that we can talk to each other. You're so far away. And you're yes, going into winter now. And we're going into summer. Yes, yes, it's actually just getting dark here now because it's uh, they were going into winter. So uh, oh, well, we right, have light right. until eight thirty. Eight thirty, right. the light. Yeah, so. yeah big, very lovely. Big, big moon last night. No, oh, this weekend. Yes. Okay, yes. Victoria, thank you so much for inviting me again, and I will send you some ideas for the next one. Please do. Okay. We're we're on tenterhooks waiting for the next one. Okay. Thank you so much thank for your you. time.